Hey, hey, this episode was filmed during the COVID pandemic, so for the safety of our cast, everyone is seated six feet apart. Also, this series is for information and entertainment purposes only. It isn't intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, so don't delay or disregard professional medical advice based on the information provided. And, as always, if this is a medical emergency, dial 911. Welcome to Going to Hell. For people, from people. So this one time... Oh, I want to go get some tasty waves, bro. You know, my aunt had a sleep disorder for a while and they gave her this machine. She still has an issue now. Now she has a different machine, but it's so loud at night. We'll call that sleep equipment for a second. Okay. Just call it sleep equipment. Any sort of instrument that is required to aid in sleep mm -hmm. and any sort of equipment that's required to aid in sleep if the sleep is pathologic, like CPAP. Mm -hmm. So CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. That particular machine creates positive pressure that constantly goes through into a mask or a nose mask right. or a pillow. And that positive pressure is designed to prevent the breathing passageway from closing. Mm -hmm. When you have apnea, which is the big buzzword today, we all refer to sleep apnea, right. what we worry about is that the airway collapses for a period that is long enough to cause your oxygen to drop some amount. It's very challenging for young people. You know, how do you tell an 18 year old or a 19 year old that is really looking for a relationship mm -hmm. that you're going to be using this machine for 60 years? Yeah. Right. So you see a rise, like maybe 10, maybe 20 years ago from today is the rise of, of uh, sleep apnea? Uh, you know, I have to tell you a personal story. Okay. I was trained uh, really in, he in head and neck cancer when I began my journey. And I remember uh, in the mid 90s, I sat down having lunch with a very great physician. And she asked me, she said, you know, Perry, what do you do? And I says, well, I do head and neck tumors and I do sinus work, et cetera. And I said, what do you do? She goes, well, I'm a sleep specialist. And I said, a sleep specialist? Right. I said, what is that? I said, I've never even heard of such a specialty. We didn't really understand as a surgeon, I didn't understand the enormity uh, and the importance of sleep and the consequences of failed sleep. Mm -hmm. Today, it may be the most important part of our life. The number of diseases and disorders that are brought on by the apnea expel may be the most consequential disease that we face societally today. Diabetes is directly linked to sleep apnea. Are you seeing technologies regarding the machine itself? Because like you mentioned earlier, you know, this enormous machine in order for someone to breathe at night. Are you seeing potential advances where it's going to be smaller, more compact? You know, it began with essentially a vacuum cleaner turned backwards and a mask put over the face to blow air, right? right? right. I mean, that was as big as this chair, this uh, table. Now they're this big, compact and tiny. Okay. Huge changes are going on and every year they continue to improve and the software and now with AI, you know, it's become yeah. an entirely new world with AI. And how does a sleep study work? What's the procedure with that? There are several variants on how to test sleep, you know, there's, and there's a whole series of things. The, the gold standard today is still an in-lab sleep study done in a sort of a private bedroom. In that process, you basically go into a lab and they sit you down in a room and they hook you up to a sarcophagus of wires. They put an EKG lead on you, they put a finger oxygen monitor on you, they, they put electrodes on your legs to monitor for restless leg syndrome. And those allow you to monitor all those parameters of sleep. And lastly, they videotape you. So all those parameters are then assimilated and they have recording data on all, let's say, 14 parameters for six hours. And then there is a specialized technician who actually looks at all of that data and then scores it and interprets it and decides what each of those parameters means. And then there are specialized physicians that are sleep physicians that will then overread that and basically make a final interpretation and then a final recommendation. Wow, I, I would find it interesting if they were videotaping me. And they do, they do videotape. So do you ever see, uh, I'm sure you see patients that are big sleepwalkers and sleep talkers. We, we do, you know, there's a, you know, sleep 
talking and sleepwalking are all sleep disturbances, these parasomnias. So we do see uh, various things and those aren't normal things to have. So what kind of treatments are there for sleepwalkers and sleep talkers? Well, the most important thing is diagnosis, right? Diagnose the condition and then you can establish the best treatment, whether that's medical treatment, whether it's machinery or sleep equipment or surgeries or um, in, implants that we can put into the tongue or uh, positional devices. I mean, the number of treatments are, good treatments are endless. What is really important is that when you go beyond that and say, boy, I have a sleep disturbance and I have something wrong, then you really need to sort of look at what are the options out there. You know, what are the things that you can do that are going to restore your sleep and create safety from you from a medical perspective? So there are really two factors. One, how do I make my sleep better, that I feel better? And then two, how do I make sure that I don't have a problem that's serious medically? Um, I experience, however, that whenever I watch TV or a movie, I instantly fall asleep. Uh -huh. Is there any correlation to, you know, actually like television or TV shows soothing and actually helping sleep, or is it in your studies the opposite? Always? Actually, you know, as part of some of our analysis of sleep, we have these various different scores. We use the, like an Epworth sleepiness scale or a, a stop bang test, where we actually look at do you fall asleep when you're watching TV? And a lot of people do. They turn the television on, they fall asleep. That's actually not necessarily a good sign that may indicate a sleep disturbance. Oh. So, in fact, if you find yourself falling asleep uh -oh. on television, that may be something you have to, uh -oh, anyway. you know, it's the same way, you know, do you fall, you do? Do you fall asleep trouble. driving the car? Well, obviously the answer is I hope not, but the same way with uh, television, you know, if you're watching TV, you should be stimulated to be awake. And, and people need to understand that when you're analyzing a sleep pattern, it isn't just simply sleeping or not sleeping. We right. look at brain waves and we look at stages of sleep, and we look at leg movements and jerking of the muscles, and we look at oxygen levels, and we look at heart and heart rhythms. It's an extraordinary experience. There's often 14 parameters of sleep or more that are evaluated, so it gives you a wonderful platform of understanding of what the problem is. Well, this has been so interesting. We learned so much from you, and how could somebody get in touch with you? Well, the best way is the, is perrymansfieldmd.com. That's the easiest way to, to reach me. Uh, very easy to find. Are there any national resources that people can go to to learn more about sleep? The National Sleep Foundation is really full of fantastic resources. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine, and those are two great organizations that I think bring a lot of great information to us. They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We believe the road to health is paved with good information. Thank you for joining us on this quest for quality sleep. We'll see you next time on The Road.